Hello everyone, and welcome to this screencast about understanding pattern matching in Clojure using Core.Match. This is going to be a whistle-stop introduction aimed at people who are absolute beginners to pattern matching. If you've had experience with the concept before in another language, and especially if you've used it before in Clojure with Core.Match, then this isn't going to be the video for you. In that case, I'd recommend that you guys check out Sean Johnson's great talk that he did at Clojure West this year about pattern matching where he goes much more into the history of pattern matching and gives some more complicated real-world examples. Uh, but for those of you who are absolute beginners and are sticking around, uh, welcome and let's dive in. So what is pattern matching? Pattern matching is the act of checking a sequence of tokens for the presence of a pattern. Now that's kind of an academic explanation that's a little bit hard to understand in the abstract. So as per usual with my screencast, we're going to dive in with some code examples. Uh, but before we do that, I want to talk a little about the library that we'll be using, which is core.match. And core.match is an optimized pattern matching library for Clojure. So Clojure doesn't have pattern matching built in out of the box. Uh, we're using this library that's been written by David Nolan for the most part. Uh, and uh, so how do we pull that into a project and get started using it? And uh, what is pattern matching all about? So let's take a look. Okay, so we'll hop into the light table here and uh, you'll see that I've already created a lining and project and all you do to pull it in is just add it to your uh, vector of dependencies. Simple as that. And then if we hop over to the core CLJ that you, you'll see that I'm also requiring core.match and referring match. Okay, but what is pattern matching and why exactly would we want to use it? Well, like I mentioned in the definition, it's all about matching a sequence of tokens against the pattern. But what use is that? How are we going to use that in our programs? Well, we use it to do a conditional branch. Now, the most basic way you do a conditional branch in most programming languages is by using the if construct. And that's true in Clojure as well. So if we take a look at this first example, we've set a var to true. If x is true, then we run uh, the keyword one. And if it's false, we uh, execute the keyword two. So let's run this and it should be returning the keyword one, which it does. So that's the absolute most basic case where you're just testing a predicate and you're doing one way or the other way. There are slightly more complicated uh, inbuilt versions of conditional branching enclosure, including the case uh, special form. So let's take a look at how that works. And so this time we've set x to three. We're doing a case on x. If it's one, we'll return one, two, two, three, three, else we'll return four. So in this case, we're hoping it will return the keyword three, which it does. So here we're using the match keyword from the core.match library. And you'll, if you notice, it looks almost identical to using case. The only difference is we're using the else keyword rather than just defaulting with else. So if we run this, it should return three in just the same way that case does. So we've done conditional branching based on the value, but you're thinking it to yourself right now, but where's the pattern? There is no pattern. And it does exactly the same thing that case does. And in this case, <laughs> pardon the pun, that's exactly what's happening. So you wouldn't use it in this case where you only have one variable or it's a simple single variable that doesn't have any structure to the data. Then you can just as well use case. However, if we take a look at a more slightly more complicated example, you'll see where pattern matching starts to come into its own. So let's look at vectors. So here we're gonna match against a vector that has four uh, Boolean values, false, true, false, true. And you can see straight away now that it's the shape of the data that we're matching against. So in this case, we're using the underscore, which means a wildcard, which means we don't care what that value is in, in the, the pattern, the, the pattern of tokens that we're trying to match against. So anything for the first one, false, true, and true. And just by comparing it to the value that we're passing in, you can see that that's not gonna match. Then you've got false, true, we don't care, we don't care. And, if, and just by looking, you see it matches. Okay, we're expecting it to return two and then the other ones aren't gonna match. So let's run that and see that it returns two, it does. And just to help you see how does this compare to using built-in functions for doing this, if we did this with a cond, instead of doing pattern matching, you'll see that we have to do a lot of ands, we have to do it, there are a lot more parentheses, but, but the main difference that I see is that you don't see the shape of the data. With this, it's much harder to, at a glance, see which one of these is gonna match. You have to be the compiler in your head and work out each conditional and then figure out, okay, it's also going to return two. No, there's a bug here. True, true, true. Okay. Oh, because the, it has a different set of input values. Let's, let's change these. I made a bug in the code here. 
false true. Okay, so now it returns two as expected. So that's where the value comes in. It's seeing the shape of the data and, and also the conciseness of the code. It's less code, it's less to read, less to reason about. So that's when it starts to come into its own. But it comes into its own even more when you have an even more complicated data structure. So let's take a look at nested vectors. So this is a vector of vectors. So we've got one three element vector with one, two, three, and one with four, five, six. And here all we do to match it is describe the shape the same way you would do when you're destructuring. When you destructure, you describe the shape of the data. And if you haven't got into destructuring before, I have a video on that and I'll link it at the bottom of this one in the description. So we can see straight away that two in the third place isn't gonna match because that's a three. So we know it's not gonna be one. One, one doesn't match, we see it straight away. Wildcard, so anything, two, three, that's matching so far. Four, five, matching. Six, we, it's a wildcard, so three is gonna match. So let's run that and it returns three. So it's just, it's the visual feedback of being able to see how the data is shaped. Whereas if we take a look at the built-in closure version of this, where again, we're using cond on a lot of ands, Again, the shape of the data is totally lost. Again, you just have to look on a case-by-case -case basis at each predicate and try and figure out which one is gonna match. So, so it, it makes much better use of our, our human ability to visualize things and visualize shapes and patterns. The brain has evolved to be really good at that. And this lets you write code that takes advantage of that. Very useful. So what other functionality does it have? Can it just do vectors? No, it can also cope with sequences. So we have a really simple sequence here, one, two, three. And the only difference you'll notice is instead of just being the straight vector as before, what we actually have is a list where the first element is the vector that we, because it's still an ordered sequence. Uh, but the second element in the list is a keyword telling a core dot match that you need to treat this as a sequence. Otherwise it's exactly the same. So one, two, three is gonna match the third one, hopefully. Yes, number three. I haven't, uh, because sequences and vectors are basically equivalent apart from the keyword, I haven't shown a closure version for that because it would be very similar to the vector one. Okay then, let's take a look at maps. So again, we're matching on uh, the shape of the data. You can say, so we're passing in a map, A is one, the keyword B is set to one as well. And we describe the data the same way again, we do with destructuring, so we just give it the, the map shape. A is blank or wildcard, B is two, not gonna match. A is one, true, B is wildcard, that should match. C, D, E, they don't even exist, so that's not gonna match, so we should get two on that one, and we do. Okay, how would this work if we do it the standard way? Again, it's a cond, again, it's equals, again, you don't see the shape of the data. And again, it's more code, you're starting to get the idea here that it's gonna be the same story every time. It's all about conciseness, clarity, and ease of seeing the pattern. Okay, let's talk about more features then. Binding, this is something really useful that you get built in with core.match. And that's the fact that you can bind variable names. So instead of using a wildcard where you say, I don't care about the value of this, it can be anything as long as the other parts of the pattern match. What you do with a wildcard is say, this can be anything so I don't care what the value is, but I do want to use that value later. So it stores the value as it's matching and then lets you make use of it later. So you'll see on this one that 323 three is gonna match the first one. So it should return one and then the value of the third element in the vectors. So it should be one, three, and it is. Now, Clojure doesn't really have support for, at least to my knowledge, for doing this kind of live binding as part of a conditional branching. Uh, so here I've had to cheat and do the let binding before the conditional, which isn't really the same thing that's happening with the, the live binding here, um, but it does give the same result. So that's another win for core.match versus the built-in uh, branching. Okay, another feature, or patterns. So this is cool. This is a way of saying, instead of saying, I don't care what the value is in this position in the sequence, you say, I want it to be one thing or another, and you can give um, a, a multiple list here instead of just two. So if we look at this one, this would uh, match as true if it's either three or four, which it isn't in this case, the second element is two, and this one will match if it's two or five. So we're expecting that this will return keyword two, and it does. 
And again, look, look at the increase in complexity if you're not using core match, if you want to get the same behavior. Again, we're using conditional, but now we need to use an and, and a nested or, and it suddenly starts to get quite tricky to reason about the code. Not that tricky, but at least it would take you a little bit more time to sort of pass it with your eyes and understand what, what's going on. Whereas with this one, again, you can just use your, your pattern recognition skills to, to see, to feel somehow that this one is gonna match. Whereas uh, this code, harder to pass, but let's just, let's just see it returns the same value. It does. One more feature I'm gonna show you before we get to the, the when of this, and that's guards. So guards are a way to say, as long as you can give a function and as long as that function returns true, then it will let that, that, uh, that token in the sequence pass through. It will say that's a match. So if we're matching on a vector here that has two elements, one and two, this says if the first element uh, is odd, then it will go through. So it's saying, don't bind it. I don't, I, anything can get through. Uh, telling core match use the guard function and this is the guard function that I want to use. So if it's odd, let it through. So it's a list with the three elements, the, the binding, telling it guard, and then passing in the function. But as well as passing in built-in functions like this, you can also use uh, your own um, anonymous functions using the, the hash bracket percentage uh, closure way of uh, writing anonymous functions. So it's the same thing, we're using odd, but this is just to show you that you can define your own functions live as you're using the guard. And you can also do it the, uh, the long-winded uh, anonymous function way and pass in the parameter this way. So let's think quickly which one is gonna match. So the first one is odd and the second one is not odd. So the first one shouldn't match. The first one is odd and the second one is a wildcard. We don't care about it. So this should return keyword two, let's check. It does, great. Now in this case, the, the built-in version, you might say, looks a bit cleaner. It's actually a bit less code. Um, although I've just noticed I have cheated a bit here and not used the anonymous version of the, the function. So that's partially why this looks a bit better. But it's true that if you're just doing guarding, then you could maybe argue that it's better to do with conditionals if you're just going for pure aesthetics of the code. However, when guarding is useful is when you use it in combination with the or, with the binding, with the other features of the pattern matching to get into a complicated set of, uh, a complicated data shape of a data structure. It, it's that the fact that it gives you that in combination. So that's where guard really comes into its own. So, so let's take a look at something like that. Let's take a look at uh, real world in inverted commas example. Uh, I think Sean actually said that he wasn't going to show a Fibonacci example in his video and I'm the first thing I show is the Fibonacci example. Why is that? I think it's because if, if you're new to something, seeing uh, an algorithm that you've seen before that you have some kind of feeling about how it works is very useful because it gives you something to compare to. Uh, so this is one way of, of implementing the Fibonacci algorithm using core.match. So how's this working then? So we're calling match, we're doing it on just a, a single um, var. So it's not a shape of data, it's just a single digit that we're passing in, it's an N, it's a single digit. And we're matching that digit and we're saying, uh, if it's less than or equal to zero, then return zero. And this is just to protect us against somebody putting in minus five or something, so it doesn't blow up. So it, less than or equal to zero, it's gonna return zero. And this is also the termination case because when it gets down to zero, it will return zero. Uh, if it matches one, it returns one. And then if it matches it, it, the wild cards or any other number that we pass in, what it's gonna do, it's gonna add calling itself recursively by decrementing n by one at, and adding that to calling itself recursively and decrementing n by two. You wanna hopefully know how the Fibonacci algorithm works. So if we evaluate that and then run it. What is the Fibonacci of seven? It's 13 and now, now we have this function, we can map it across the range of zero to 14 and we get the Fibonacci sequence. And uh, yeah, it shows a few of the features. Um, running, we're using guard, we're using, uh, we're not binding, but we're using the wildcard and uh, it gives you a feeling of how you can start to use this in real functions. Uh, what's another place that you might be using this? And I have to be honest with you here, uh, 
pattern matching is not something that I use every day when I'm programming. In fact, I, I tend to use it quite rarely. It's not all the time that the exact uh, scenario pops up where you're dealing with a complex data structure and you need to branch off of different patterns within it. However, what I would say about pattern matching is it's great to know it. It's great to have it in your toolkit because when you do need it, then it can be the perfect thing that makes your code more readable. It makes it easier for other people to understand what you're doing as long as they understand pattern matching. And uh, yeah, you can be the superhero on the team that makes some really beautiful code in your code base. So that's what I think is great about call up match. So, so one more quick example. Again, it's pretty noddy. It's not really real world uh, like the examples in Sean's video. But again, it's hopefully going to help you understand a little bit more about what's going on. So we've got a greet function. You pass in uh, some names, which is just a string, as you can see down here. So names is a string. All we're doing is um, we're uh, pouring that into a vector after doing the reseq based on uh, a pattern that matches against words. So that's just going to split it into a list of words, a vector of words, separate words. And then we can do matching based on if there's just one entry in the vector, then we know it's a nickname. If there are two, the f we know it's a first name and a last name. And here, all I'm doing is outputting them as a map. But you could do whatever you want in your code base. This is just a way of showing that you can do it for things like validation like this. It can be useful. If we've got three names, we can, we we're going to pull out the middle name. If there's a title, a last name, and then of house. And it, this shows that you can also use ampersand to, to grab the remaining parts the same way you can do with the structuring. And then finally, if the, the sort of default version on this one, if, if it didn't match any of them, then you've probably got a lot of names. And then we're going to say the number of names is too damn high. So let's execute that. And let's see what happens when we pass in Danny. It's figured out it's, it's gone in and figured out, okay, you, you, we've only got one element. So that's the shape of the data. We've matched this pattern. Here we've got two names. So we know that the first name is Daenerys, second name Targaryen. Three names, we know the middle name. You're starting to get the idea. Here we have the of house pattern that we're matching against and the fact that it has a house name. And then we say we don't care about the rest. So we run that one. We know that the title is Queen and the house name is Targaryen. And finally, if we use all of Daenerys's names, we get 27 names is too damn high. And that was it really. Pretty fast, high level overview. Like I said, you're going to use it rarely, but when you use it, it can be amazing. And uh, I hope you grokked it, hope you understood it, hope this was useful, and uh, thank you very much for watching.